Test, can you hear me in the back? Great. Good evening and welcome to Lafayette Library. My name is Vicki Shock. I'm manager of the Lafayette Library. Our distinguished speakers program tonight, like many of the 1,100 programs the library offers each year, is brought to you through the generous contributions of library donors, the Friends of the Lafayette Library, and the Lafayette Library and Learning Center Foundation, and people like yourself who purchase a ticket this evening. Tonight we are pleased to welcome David Talbot, author of The Devil's Chessboard, Alan Dulles, the CIA, and the Rise of America's Secret Government a biography examining the career of Alan Dulles. Talbot's portrait of Alan Dulles, the CIA's fifth and longest serving director, draws on recently discovered documents ranging from the correspondence and journals of Dulles' wife and mistress to US government documents and European intelligence sources to show that Dulles used his position to further his own public and private agendas. Mr. Talbot is author of the New York Times bestseller, Brothers, The Hidden History of the Kennedy Years, and the acclaimed national bestseller, Season of the Witch. He is the founder and former editor-in-chief of Salon, and was a senior editor at Mother Jones Magazine, and features editor at the San Francisco Examiner. He, he has written for The New Yorker, Rolling Stone Time, and other major publications. Please join me in welcoming Mr. David Talbot. Thank you. Well, I thought that was my cue. I was getting drunk back there, so I wasn't sure. After driving in your traffic all the way from San Francisco, I needed a, at least one of these. We should all have one. In fact, someone's about to uh, bring the bottle out, so maybe we can pass it around. Anyway, thank you for coming out tonight. Um, frankly, I haven't really uh, put a lot of, I, I usually write speeches, and just tonight, because of everything that's happening in the world, I thought we'd open this up pretty quickly to have a conversation. I know all of you are probably just as freaked out about the state of the world and the state of our country as I am. Uh, so I'll, I'll just start with a few remarks, maybe to uh, break the ice and get things rolling while I have another drink. And, uh, and then we can open this up to a lively conversation, I hope. So excuse, <laughs> excuse me one sec. I've been thinking a lot about the law or the lack of the law a lot lately, in part because someone very close to my family, who's African American and young, was arrested, and I had to see him be processed the way that young minorities are processed by our legal system. This happened to be in San Mateo County, where one pu public defender told me it was like the Deep South. Imagine that in our liberal Bay Area, a county that's kind of like the Deep South when it comes to young minority men. Uh, and I've spent, a, as you know, if you're familiar with my work, uh, a lot of time thinking and writing about law of a different kind, the laws that are broken by more powerful people. Uh, and this pattern of lawlessness, unfortunately, has been characterizing our country at the top for many years now, certainly throughout my life, and I think really throughout the Cold War period in particular, up through the War on Terror. We unfortunately are grappling with an era, era that's defined, I think, by imperial hubris and arrogance, and the backlash from uh, terror organizations and groups and peoples who feel abused, exploited, uh, violated by that imperial arrogance. And yet, the country really doesn't do any soul searching about that because the national discourse is dominated by an ignorant, willfully ignorant, and superficial media that only can indulge in American triumphalism and propaganda 
and is incapable, except on the fringes of the media, the marginal media that we are all aware of and that we probably read and look at, of really grappling or attempting to grapple with the truth. We suffer from, a, as a country, I think, a, a type of amnesia, historical amnesia. And that's uh, one primary reason why I was compelled to write the books that I write out of my own curiosity, because I felt that we weren't getting at the, the crux of the problem in this country. You know, ever since I was a, a kid in Los Angeles growing up, and I bumped into an old friend who we went to high school together, it was a military school, I was kind of asked to leave in the middle of my senior year, but uh, I did learn a certain discipline there. But uh, I, I worked on Bobby Kennedy's campaign uh, for president in uh, 1968, and it was one of the first traumas that I can remember in a very vivid sense that just was not addressed by those in power. And he had a sense that something had happened that night just like something had happened to his brother in Dallas that, that the country was incapable of honestly looking at. That was the same for me and many in our generation with the war in Vietnam, that we never really quite got at the heart of why we were in Vietnam, what had happened there, who was responsible for that, and the many war crimes that were committed in our name. And so this pattern of uh, negligence, of a refusal, a willful refusal to grapple with these deep truths about our country and why we keep doing the things that we're doing. I mean, if an individual who keeps, you know, engaging in these kind of uh, uh, negative patterns, these violent patterns would you know, be compelled, hopefully at some point, to visit a shrink. But America has yet to do that. We've taken some steps in that direction, particularly after Watergate in the 1970s with some congressional investigation, uh, the church committee and so on that attempted to get to, uh, to shed some light, not entirely, but some light, on the excesses of the CIA, but uh, that was an aborted investigation, as was the House Select Committee on Assassinations in the late 70s. And America, since that period, I think, has only become more willfully ignorant uh, and more uh, self-congratulatory uh, and less mature, in some ways, as a nation than ever. And now we have Donald Trump and we have Ted Cruz. And we have a, a kind of alternate reality that I, I, I'm sure none of us have ever seen in our lives. So we have someone who now wants to unleash the torturers rather than bring those people responsible to justice. We want someone who wants more violence and more bloodshed and more civilian casualties in the Middle East instead of, again, beginning to deeply question why we are there and what we're doing in the Middle East. But it's not just Trump. This is part of a long legacy, again, in America. It, a legacy that we have to lay at the doorstep, of course, of George W. Bush, but of Obama as well of Dick Cheney, but the Clintons as well, and even further back. And that's the territory that I got into with the devil's chessboard. Because here you have the rise of a dynasty, the Dulles Circle, including the two brothers, of course, Alan Dulles, America's most legendary spy master, and in some ways, the godfather of modern American intelligence, and his brother, John Foster Dulles, who ran uh, the State Department during the same period, during the, uh, the Eisenhower presidency. But really, they were just at the center of a circle of people that included um, Wall Street bankers and lawyers, people in the national intelligence world, that keep popping up in one presidency after the next, if you look at American history. They don't go away with the elections. Elections are a, an ephemeral thing uh, in these men's lives. They're what C. Wright Mills, the great sociologist, uh, who I think was the, our leading scholar of the Cold War and American power in that period, called, of course, the power elite. Uh, and these uh, are men who, as C. Wright Mills said, create reality all of their own. 
a paranoid reality all of their own. Um, and then we're forced to live within it. There's always boogeymen, there's always enemies, there's always people that we have to arm against, there's always reasons to keep feeding this enormous uh, national security system that we've built, the one that uh, Dwight Eisenhower called the military industrial complex and warned his young successor, JFK, about, and the rest of the country. That was convenient for Dwight, for Ike. He had helped build that uh, military industrial complex and it had uh, basically licensed the Dulles brothers to do whatever they wanted with it. But uh, he had a pang of, of conscience as he was leaving and he thought that he should warn us. But the national, the, rather that military industrial complex has only morphed into something much more monstrous uh, nowadays. In fact, in some ways our entire culture, entire society, our entire economy has been militarized. It's no longer just a complex. We are the complex. The arrogance of power that was demonstrated by the Dulles brothers, as I write in my book, goes back to World War II or even earlier, when the Dulles brothers decided that Franklin Roosevelt was taking the country down the wrong path, and they advised their clients on Wall Street, they ran the biggest law firm uh, on Wall Street, Sullivan and Cromwell, to simply defy FDR's attempts to regulate Wall Street. Ride this out, they said. Glass-Steagall and all the rest, it took a little while, but they finally got rid of that. And when Alan Dulles uh, joined the OSS, our spy agency during World War II, he had himself sent not to England, where most of his colleagues were, to London, but to Switzerland. And there was a reason for that, because he could operate pretty much unsupervised there. And what he does there, Alan Dulles, rather than it, uh, advance the interests of the Allies and uh, send intelligence home on Nazis and so on, uh, penetrate the, the Nazi enemy, he's mainly involved with making deals with the Nazis because many of these people happen to be his former business clients and even current business clients. Some of the most notorious uh, German firms that collaborate with the Nazi regime, including IG Farben, the notorious company that manufactured, among other things, Zyklon B, which was used to gas the Jews in the camps. The head of that company was sending cheery Christmas cards to the Dulles brothers right up into the early years of the war. There was a, a, a bank in Switzerland called the Bank of International Settlements that was essentially the biggest laundering machine for Nazi assets. That was run by a very close friend, an American, during the war, Thomas McKittrick, a very close friend of the Dulles brothers. FDR and Henry Morgenthau, his secretary of the treasury, regarded McKittrick and the Dulles brothers as traitors. And when McKittrick came back to New York uh, for a business visit during the war, they attempted to arrest him. But instead, his business colleagues, including the heads of some of the biggest corporations in America, GM, Standard Oil, and others, threw him a party at the Waldorf Astoria, and because of John Foster Dulles's intervention, he was allowed to go back unscathed to Switzerland and continue basically to represent Nazi business interests as the head of this bank, which was, uh, as I said, used to launder the loot uh, that the Nazis were stealing from Jews and from occupied countries. So, this pattern of defiance uh, where the Dulles brothers again and again uh, de determined their own policy, no matter what the president happened to be saying, continued throughout the war. Uh, the uh, allies in Casablanca uh, formulated a policy of unconditional surrender. They weren't going to cut deals with the Nazis. They were going to crush the Nazis and bring them to justice. FDR, it was very important for FDR to push through that uh, agreement because he, know, he knew that the Soviet Union was a key ally and that Stalin, who was busy defending Stalingrad at the time and couldn't come to Casablanca, was, was perpetually afraid that he was going to be sold out by England and by the United States. And so uh, FDR formulated this policy of unconditional surrender. But in fact, on the ground in Switzerland, Dulles, once again, is 
defying that policy secretly. He's meeting with Nazis, he's trying to cut a separate peace deal, and in the final days of the war, as FDR is dying and is in no longer in a position to fight back against Dulles, he does indeed conclude a, bat, a stab in the back uh, deal against the Soviet Union with Nazi forces in Italy. After the war, um, he and his right-hand man, James Angleton, who later became head of counterintelligence under Dulles, are busy in Italy setting up Nazi rat lines so uh, some of the top war criminals uh, can escape from Germany over the Alps down through Italy and overseas. And some of these men are actually even rehabilitated by Dulles, who's more concerned with building a strong Germany against the Soviet Union some of these war criminals, including Reinhard Galen, as I write in the book, the head of uh, Hitler's intelligence on the bloody Eastern Front, he is rescued from Nuremberg by Dulles and made into the head of West German intelligence, a very powerful post that he holds throughout most of the Cold War. Here's a man who should have been put on trial in Nuremberg and probably hung, and he instead is eating hot dogs at Yankee Stadium and watching uh, Joe DiMaggio play his last game courtesy of the CIA in 1953, I believe it was, World Series. So um, anyway, I, I wrote this book with great spleen, I think. <laughs> I wanted to write an anti-spy novel, as I put it. Um, I tried to write the book as much as possible to be a page turner. There's amazing characters in this book. Um, the, uh, and if you've dipped into it, you, you, you know who I'm talking about, and we can talk about that more later. It goes from the Nazi period up through the Cold War, um, the creation of Richard Nixon by the Dulles brothers, the rise of JFK as an opponent of Dulles philosophy, and uh, of course the cataclysmic events um, in 1963 in Dallas and the convenient role that then Alan Dulles plays on the Warren Commission, uh, investigating the murder of a president uh, who was a mortal enemy, political enemy of his. But uh, to me, what I was trying to do was write a real life Game of Thrones. Uh, we don't think of America as a class-based society. We don't think of America as having these kind of um, conspiracies and shadow politics the way that uh, older societies, European societies and more ancient societies have, but certainly we're, we're not immune from that. Um, we do have dynastic politics. We do have oligarchic politics. We do have conspiracies. That's the way that power functions. Power never wants to be uh, out in the uh, spotlight. They always do their business behind closed doors, and it's the the uh, obligation for us as informed citizens and for me and my colleagues as journalists and historians and so on to expose the functionings of power so we can make informed decisions as an American citizenry. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen uh, all that often. And in momentous moments of national security when major decisions like should we go to war or not uh, in Iraq, are debated, our media have let us down again and again and again. And I'm not talking just about Fox News, I'm talking about the New York Times, the so-called great liberal beacon of enlightenment, which of course played a uh, shameful role in the run-up to the war in Iraq, helping create the myth of the WMDs, the reporting of Judith Miller and others. Um, so it's up to mavericks again and again, it's up to independents, it's up to the rebels, it's up to the whistleblowers who pay for their bravery by being uh, put in jail and forced into exile and so on to, uh, to raise our consciousness as Americans. And uh, the very least we can owe these people who take these risks is to listen to what they have to say, to debate what they have to say, to discuss it, and to make informed decisions uh, during election time. Um, so even when our elections become complete mad circuses like the current one, it's our duty to be smarter and to think smarter and act smarter. So with that, I'm going to open things up, and I'm sure we can have a lively conversation. I hope so. I haven't, need another drink here.
Questions? Yes, in the front. So, did you all hear the question? Do I think it matters who happens to occupy the White House? Well, it, this is, you put your finger on the argument, a debate I've been having with my colleague, Karen Croft, forever. Karen, as you know, if you've read The Devil's Chessboard, I dedicate the book to her, has worked on all my books with me, and she takes, a, a, I think, a much more dark view than I do of this. She thinks that the, the, the lesson of the Kennedy presidency is that, no, it doesn't matter who's in the White House, that if a president does defy the national security state, that he would be eliminated. He was eliminated. I happen to believe that's the case with what happened with JFK, and we can talk about that more. Um, I know for a fact that every president since Kennedy has taken note of what happened to JFK. I met the Clintons. I covered the Clinton administration when I was running Salon. I was in the Clinton White House, and they invited me there because we were defending them against the uh, Ken Starr's impeachment uh, circus. And I know for a fact that Bill Clinton, one of the first things he did was to ask his attorney general, Webb Hubble, find out who killed Kennedy. Um, and Hubble, you know, went through all the files he could and reported back before they got rid of him, of course. Um, it's above my pay grade, Mr. President. Uh, it is above people's pay grade, uh, you know, certain things that happen in America. It's above our pay grade as citizens. Um, we've been lied to consistently about things like that. So. I understand uh, Karen's argument uh, that it doesn't matter, but I'm more like Bobby Kennedy on this. When Bobby Kennedy was asked near the end of his own life during a PBS show why he kept doing what he was doing, running for president, he looked haggard, he looked years older than he really was. Ah, thank you. Is this? Oh, good. He was uh, wrinkled. He was he looked like he hadn't had sleep for days. He, you know, the, when he would throw himself into these crowds during that campaign, they scratched him, they clotted him. American people were so desperate for uh, salvation after what happened to his brother, after years of the war in Vietnam, after what was happening in our inner cities and our, the race riots, um, and so you saw this all etched into his you know, his, uh, this mournful face. And he said, so this, the interviewer asked him, you know, why do you keep doing this? Um, and he paused a moment, he said, there's really no other way, is there? And um, I think that's what it comes down to in some sense. It's an existential decision. You, even though you think that it may not matter, you have to act as if it does because once you stop acting as if it does, all is lost. And so Bernie Sanders' campaign probably will fail, probably will fall short. The system is rigged. The superdelegate system is obviously a, a, you know, an affront to American democracy and the so-called Democratic Party, what a joke. But, um, and yet, I think the, the energy that he's unleashed hopefully will gel into something that has longer consequences and that movement won't evaporate the way that Obama purposefully, I believe, let his own movement evaporate once he uh, took the White House. I think the people behind Obama did not want that kind of populist energy to be sustained. And so instead, we had the populist energy on the right, the Tea Party, with nothing to push back against that from the grassroots on the left. And Obama became a, uh, a you know, a, uh, his hands were tied as a result throughout most of his presidency. So do I feel that it does matter who's president? Not now, but it could.
I think we were fooled by Obama. I was fooled. I worked for him. I, when I saw when Sarah Palin was, uh, you know, put on the ticket by McCain, and it looked like for a while that that was going to be a game changer. I went back to Salon. I'd left Salon. I was working on books at that point. But I went back to Salon. Went up to Alaska to report on her, uh, and dug up some very interesting stuff on her. Um, but. I, and Obama certainly knew how to use the rhetoric of the 60s. He was a master at channeling the spirit of Martin Luther King. I fell for it hook, hook, line, and sinker. I was in the streets the night he was elected with my kids, uh, you know, back in 2008. And I still think just the fact that an African American was elected was, I think, beneficial for the country. But he was not who we thought we, he was. I went to private school with my friend here. I, you know, prep school, I know what that sort of process is all about. He went to Punahou, of course. He was handpicked from the very beginning, I think, to, uh, you know, to sort of be acculturated in that elite world. Then he goes to Claremont, he goes to, on to the Ivy League. Um, he, no president, I think, uh, who went through that process is going to defy power. And by power, I mean Wall Street and the national security state. That's who runs this country. We all know that. And he, the, he gave it away uh, a month before he was elected. Remember the crash started to happen. That was a very key moment in American history. September, was it, 2008? McCain panics, you know, doesn't show his leadership ability. He says we should suspend the campaign. But meanwhile, Chuck Schumer, who's the senator from Wall Street, sets up like a kind of godfather soprano sit down between Obama and the heads of Wall Street, basically, the top people. And they basically delivered the message, Schumer and Obama, to Wall Street, you don't have to fear an Obama presidency. And I, we saw uh, him deliver on that immediately. Who was the first appointment? I think the very first appointment that was announced before he was even inaugurated was Tim Geithner, who's a complete creature of Wall Street, and Larry Summers, the same. So that was his signal to Wall Street that, don't worry, you're still uh, in good hands here. So, you know, I think we were fooled by Obama. He was not the agent of change uh, that he uh, made us believe he was going to be. Uh, he was a very much of a corporate centrist. And now we have a situation where the people of this country are so outraged, they, they feel so sold out, uh, that they're willing to go, uh, you know, jump on board this charlatan's bandwagon, this billionaire uh, buffoon who will make life even worse for them. You know, uh, I have a reporter, I have a new uh, imprint, an investigative book imprint called Hot Books, um, and I can talk more about a couple of books. In fact, I have a couple of books with me I'd like to show you later. Um, and I have a young reporter out on the road now with Trump. And he's interviewing a lot of these people, uh, you know, maimed veterans, uh, people who've been out of work for years, people who are desperate. And you know, we think of these people as these, um, this goon squad somehow. Uh, they're not us. They're some you know, ignorant other. But they are us. They're these wounded Americans who are desperately trying to figure out how to save themselves and their family. And they've been told, given a line of rhetoric by people in the Republican Party and the Democratic Party for so long now that they've given up. As this woman was suggesting, do we believe that anyone can help us in the White House? No, they don't believe. And so when some guy like Trump stands up and at least somehow channels their anger and resentment in a way that you know, strikes a chord with them, they, of course, are flocking to him. It's incredibly dangerous, I think, moment we're in now. I mean, you know, the left, and I'm part of the left for a long time now, f tends to throw around the word fascist too easily and has for many years. But I'm a student, uh, as probably many of you are, of that history, the Weimar period in Germany and so on, what, how Germany, this very sophisticated, very civilized, very educated country, ended up going down that, um, that terrible road. And there are some parallels with what's going on today. And, and we see some of this in the rallies, the Trump rallies. So I think it's very important to, us to t not uh, caricature the Trump movement or the people who are flocking to him, but really trying to understand them. And in fact, my reporter uh, is finding some interesting dialogue at the end of these rallies after the media has gone 
when it's starting to break up between Bernie supporters and Trump supporters as they, you know, they spend most of the rally screaming at each other, but at the end they start to talk. And he's been involved in some interesting discussions between these two sides. And that to me is, you know, one of the few hopeful things that might happen. Here. Absolutely. I, did you all hear his very, all right, so he made, uh, I wish everyone heard it, it was very articulate. I, uh, the gentleman said, why aren't we doing more in the way of diplomacy rather than, uh, you know, military response to t terrorism, trying to understand uh, the people in the Middle East and uh, build bridges rather than blow them up. Um, I completely agree with that, and to me, you know, the last heroic president who really understood that, was, again, was John Kennedy. I mean, with uh, programs like the Alliance for Progress in Latin America, he gave Fidel Castro a real run for his money. I mean, Castro at that point, of course, represented the, you know, the tide of change in Latin America. For years, the country, these countries in Latin America had been held back by these old local oligarchies, the oligarchic elites, very repressive dictatorships, backed up, of course, by the uh, United States of America with military aid and so on that allowed, uh, you know, corporations, uh, min mineral companies and oil companies to loot the uh, economies of those uh, impoverished nations. Well, the Kennedy brothers came in with a different point of view. In fact, Jack Kennedy told Dick Goodwin, one of his aides, if I was living in Chile, if I was living down there, I'd be like Che Guevara. I'd be a revolutionary too. Um, and so they had a very idea, a different idea. Uh, and they did start to develop uh, massive aid programs that were not controlled by U.S. corporations for the first time. And the corporations started to really uh, get threatened by that. Um, they also practiced diplomacy. So f for me, it's all about diplomacy and development, and rather than carpet bombing and torture. And if we want more bloodshed, uh, you know, that's the formula for it, the Donald Trump formula, the Hillary Clinton formula. We've seen that, and we know how that uh, movie ends. And what we haven't tried, really, since the days of Kennedy, I think, as a way of addressing suffering and misery and, and resentment and anger in the third world is development and, and, and diplomacy. So thank you for that question. Yes, back here. I'm sorry, you asking about China or policy? Well, um, not directly, none that I see in terms of the Nazi stuff. I mean, uh, I'm sure that they're right, that U.S. trade policy with China must be obviously being determined by elites, corporate elites, and and that in that sense, again, Trump has put his finger on a source of uh, genuine 
resentment that working people have. They've been sold out by these international trade agreements again and again. And the Clintons were part of that with NAFTA, of course. And then Hillary was for the Trans-Pacific uh, Agreement until she wasn't uh, because Bernie made it a political issue of it. So yeah, I mean, you know, I think most working people feel that whenever they see the word international or the term international trade agreement, they're about to get stabbed in the back, and they generally are. Um, so it doesn't mean that we should be against all trade, as Bernie said, uh, or put up walls around. He, as I, during one debate, he was pretty funny. He said, uh, "No one wants to put up walls around the whole country." He goes, "Well, okay, one guy does, but uh, <laughs> but he goes, no rational person." <laughs> Yes, here. Uh huh. Yes. Well, that's, that's a huge question. Oh, yes. So uh, the woman asked about how some of the problems that I write about in the book, the Dulles Brothers uh, in Central America way back in the 50s, we are repeating many of those tragedies today in Central America with um, military dictatorships and firm control of these countries. And in fact, there was a progressive, uh, you know, somewhat progressive leader in Honduras briefly, who was overthrown once again with the backing of the Obama and Clinton uh, government. Um, and, you know, has led to terrible results there. In fact, one of the leading human rights activists in Honduras after this coup was just murdered in her home, I believe, a week or so ago. Uh, and how many people have even heard about the Honduras coup and, and what's happening there? I'm very few, I'm sure. Um, I happen to hear a broadcast on NPR about it, uh, but it's not exactly front page news. Um, so again, the Dulles legacy lives on. In fact, there's a, a, a bust of him in the uh, lobby of the CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia. And underneath is a chilling inscription. It says, his monument is all around us. And it is. His, the monument of uh, that kind of arrogance and interference in other countries continues to this day. Um, and the story of Guatemala, I think, is one of the most tragic. I mean, because here you have this young, attractive, progressive couple, um, wealthy, but were like the Kennedys, were completely dedicated to uh, uplifting this impoverished nation, really was a medieval nation run by land barons, uh, connected to United Fruit, this uh, agribusiness colossus uh, based in Boston that the Dulles Brothers law firm conveniently represented. And so when Akabo Arbenz, this young Kennedy-like leader, uh, takes power in 1952, I believe, um, you know, he starts some modest land reforms. Um, and it, in fact, is even compensating United Fruit for some of the land that's not being used that they're taking back and redistributing among the poor peasants. But this, of course, provokes this uh, sharp backlash from the, um, the agribusiness elites there. Uh, they get on the phone, of course, the Dulles brothers in Washington, the next thing you know, the CIA is down there trying to overthrow the government, which they do. Um, our Benz decides not to fight um, because he thinks it'll lead to a bloodbath. And so he and his glamorous wife and their children go to the airport where they're roughed up by a CIA-led mob. He's forced to strip in front of the world's press, ostensibly because they say he's smuggling cash out, but it's a further humiliation. And then that family is, the story I tell has really been lost to history. That family, this educated, very dedicated family, the Kennedys of Guatemala, are then basically stalked all over the world. They can't find refuge in any country. No country will take them in because of pressure from Washington. Finally, in desperation, they go uh, to Czechoslovakia. And of course, the, the, the world's press, instigated by the CIA, says, see, they were communists all along, which they weren't. Um, and then, of course, they don't like life in Czechoslovakia. They prefer to live in a democratic country. They come back to Mexico, uh, Cuba, and finally, um, Akabo Arbenz is found scalded to death in a bathtub in a Mexico City hotel. 
um, again, a victim, I believe, of the death list that the CIA and its local um, uh, people in Guatemala had compiled. So, you know, we, we have yet to, I think, fully understand the violence that's been done in our name, the, um, the, the political mayhem that our country has committed around the world. And so when they ask us today, why do they hate us? And, and the idiot W says, oh, they hate us for our freedoms. No, they hate us because we took away their freedom. And, uh, and we took away their national treasure in many cases. And uh, that's a legitimate reason for people to hate us. And that's what Americans have to grapple with and not listen to the simplicities of buffoons like Trump, but really grapple with why uh, we are so reviled around the rest of the world and feared. Other questions, right here. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So the young man asked about the missile gap, which was kind of a trumped up uh, phony uh, kind of campaign issue in 1960 that JFK used as a battering uh, ram against the Republicans, saying that uh, you know Eisenhower had allowed this, this uh, widening missile gap to uh, grow between the Soviet Union and the US, which was completely ridiculous. The US had uh, a huge, uh, uh, advantage still at that point, nuclear superiority. Um, you know, I've seen two different sort of stories about this, uh, but I tend to think Kennedy probably knew that missile gap was, uh, was not true, and he used it anyway. Uh, it was confirmed to him that it wasn't true by uh, Pentagon scientists late, soon it, into his administration, and he did drop that idea it's, uh, early in his presidency. But look, Kennedy, I think, was an Irish street brawler underneath his um, you know, polished and uh, charming veneer. Uh, and his brother, Bobby, who ran his campaign, was certainly an Irish street brawler. They came up from the saloons of, of Boston. And what they were determined to be was not another uh, democratic um, you know, uh, victim of Republican, you know, sort of McCarthyite tactics. And uh, again and again, they'd seen throughout the Cold War, you know, uh, very enlightened Democrats like Adlai Stevenson have, you know, you know, rolled, steamrolled, uh, and, 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 you know, basically made to look weak and hapless in campaigns. And so one of the things that I, as an Irish guy who likes brawling politics, I do uh, you know, admire the Kennedys for the way they knew how to play that game. That, you know, do I support the idea that they lied about the missile gap? Eh. He also used uh, Cuba in a very uh, kind of, I think, deceitful way, in a way. He suggested that we should invade Cuba Knowing that we actually were preparing to invade Cuba at that point, he probably had been briefed on this about the Bay of Pigs invasion, and he used it in the debate against Nixon, and because Nixon was in the administration, he couldn't come out, and it was a secret, he couldn't come out and say, we are preparing this invasion. So he, he kind of put him in a corner. So, you know, Jack Kennedy knew how to fight, and, uh, and as I say, Bobby certainly did, and um, but the thing about the Kennedys, and I think the reason why JFK went into politics and ran for president, rather, was told to me by Ted Sorensen, the speechwriter and sort of the alter ego of Kennedy. I interviewed Ted for my first book, and he said Kennedy was 
absolutely terrified by the idea that we would stumble into an accidental nuclear war. And, of course, John Foster Dulles had, in fact, used the whole tactic of nuclear brinksmanship, as had Eisenhower himself, again and again to terrify uh, our enemies. And, you know, uh, Foster Dulles kind of cavalierly threatened to use nuclear weapons again and again. Uh, in China, over these obscure islands that were in dispute, Kemoi and Matsu, in Vietnam during the French, uh, you know, military's last stand at Dien Bien Phu, and uh, in Berlin. And so Kennedy, I think, genuinely, while he ran kind of as a hawk, because in 1960, at the height of the Cold War, a Democrat couldn't possibly win unless they adopted the sort of militant language of the Cold War. But as soon as he becomes president, I think he begins an odyssey that is taking the country, out, trying to take the country out of the Cold War. And when you read his speeches, even as early as 1961, where he's saying things like, in a speech in uh, November, I think, in uh, Seattle, that you know we're a small part of the world's population. We can't expect to dominate the entire world. We have to learn to live with the rest of the world. And then, of course, culminating in his beautiful speech at Washington, at American University, rather, in Washington in June 1963, the so-called peace speech, where he says uh, about our Soviet enemies, who we've been taught to hate for so many years, we all uh, love our children, uh, we all breathe the same air, and we are all mortal, and we all have to live on this small planet together. Imagine Obama saying that today about our Islamic militant enemies. Um, you know, it just can't happen anymore. I think Kennedy paid for his life uh, with his effort to lead the country out of the Cold War. It produced a massive backlash from his national security state. He fired Alan Dulles after the Bay of Pigs. He knew he'd made a mistake by keeping this guy on. Alan Dulles did not get the memo. He was fired. This is, I think, one of the most important revelations in my book, and it has not been reported anywhere else. Alan Dulles goes home to Georgetown, where he lived, and he proceeds to continue to operate as if he is the, continuing to be the director of the CIA. He keeps a meeting with all his top deputies, Richard Helms, James Angleton, and others. He and his deputies develop policies that again and again try to countermand or sabotage Kennedy policy, which I uh, detail in the book. Uh, you know, this is a remarkable thing. And, um, you know, the... I also talk about how the assassination operation that Dulles had built, uh, and by the time he left the administration, it was run by a man named William Harvey. He was a notorious gun-toting thug who ran afoul of the Kennedys, and the CIA, to salvage his career, sent him to Rome, where he ran the CIA station. And I interviewed the children of his top deputy, a guy named Mark Wyatt, who was a good CIA guy. And he couldn't believe the things that Bill Harvey was asking him to do, including recruiting mafia assassins to kill leaders of left-wing political parties in Italy. Um, his deputy saw Bill Harvey on a plane flying to Dallas uh, in early November 1963. He was surprised to see him going there. He had no reason to go there as far as he knew. He asked him, Where, what are you doing? And Harvey was very evasive and told him something, I'm, I'm there to look around. I think Bill Harvey was involved in the assassination of President Kennedy. And uh, Howard Hunt, the famous Watergate you know, uh, you know, break-in guy, who was another legendary CIA guy, said the same thing to his son before he died. He put it on, uh, on tape, and he wrote it to him. I've seen that. Those were uh, veiled confessions that Howard Hunt was making about the CIA and their involvement. It's, we, we can't see this, though, as just some kind of isolated incident where a few CIA guys who were furious at Kennedy because of the Bay of Pigs and other things went off, went off the uh, reservation and killed him. I think what happened was, again, the, the true lesson we have to understand is how American democracy and American government broke in two during the uh, Kennedy period. And what you have is, I think, a profound backlash from people in the Dulles circle, the power elite who felt that Kennedy was an aberrant president because he was trying to lead the country out of the Cold War, and there was such a strong Cold War consensus at the time that was almost seen as being a traitor. It was seen as being a traitor by many in the sort of the business and national security elite in this country. And when you read the interviews with these men, the oral history is done with the, uh, with the generals, the admirals, 
the CIA people, some of the top corporate executives in America during that period. It makes the stuff, the hatred against Obama seem like, uh, you know, uh, a minor tiff. There, this, these were people who felt that they were losing control of the country to a young president, a weak president, whose father had a history of, um, uh, uh, of being, uh, you know, um, complicit, or not complicit, but weak on uh, uh, Germany, Nazi Germany, when his father was ambassador in London. They thought uh, Kennedy was sickly, that he just shouldn't be, that he was a playboy, that he was a lightweight, and that he shouldn't be running um, the world's most powerful military. And they thought that again and again, when he could have taken out Castro during the Cuban Missile Crisis, or when he could have um, taken out Khrushchev, even the Soviet Union, there were people who were so insane, like Curtis LeMay, head of our Air Force, who believed that while we had this window of superiority, that we should launch an all-out nuclear attack on Russia. And he said, well, you know, uh, we may suffer, uh, you know, 20 million dead or more, but uh, there'll, there'll be many more of theirs that'll be dead than ours, and that's what he considered victory. Kennedy was so revolted by this man, who was head of our Air Force and a major figure in American military, that he said, I don't want to ever see him in my own uh, sight again. So, you know, this was the kind of vitriol. Um, I interviewed Daniel Ellsberg, who was a young defense analyst at the time and hanging out with uh, Air Force officers. He said that the mood in those circles was mutinous after things like the Cuban Missile Crisis was peacefully resolved. They wanted to use the Cuban Missile Crisis to destroy Cuba, to take out that regime and do it through a nuclear attack. So, um, you know, I was 12 years old at the time. You know, I think oh, those of us who are living here uh, today owe oh, JFK enormous debt of gratitude. When you read the minutes of those XCOM meetings in the White House where we're deciding the fate of the world, they're terrifying because virtually everyone in the room except his brother is for war. And they're pushing Kennedy and they're prodding him. And Kennedy, again, is deflect. He's a master. He's not, you know, taking them on head on. He's deflecting them here. He's delaying it. He's like giving himself more time so he can open up back channels to Khrushchev in Moscow. It's a masterful performance by him and his brother. And his brother was like running, you know, sort of missions on the side and the shadows for him, meeting with people, Russians in Washington. It's an incredible story. And, and the movie 13. Uh, was it called 13 Days, if you've seen that? Not enough people did, but it was a great dramatization of that. Questions, yes? I think you work with Secretary of State Charles, uh, the UN. I think you were involved in that also. Adlai Stevenson. No, 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 um, Uthan. Oh, Uthan, uh-huh. You know, I'm sorry, just a quick, you, you reminded me of something. There was an, a, a Russian counterpart who they were using, sort of a, a back channel guy named Georgi Bolshakov, was it? Who um, developed this kind of funny friendship with Bobby. And he was one of the guys that they were doing this back channel with to try and save the world during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Later, when uh, JFK is killed, um, and, you know, the CIA is putting out the word that Lee Harvey Oswald is a communist, it was a communist plot and so on. It was important to Bobby to communicate to the Soviet Union that from his immediate research, investigation into it, that wasn't the case. He knew it was a domestic plot. So he sends a friend, it's a fascinating story, a gay guy, William Walton. This shows you how, like, uh, confident in his sexuality JFK was. He would hang out with Bill Walton, who was a painter and a former war correspondent, kind of a charming guy in his underwear in the White House uh, while Bill Walton would show him. He was given the job of sort of uh, renovating Lafayette uh, Square, is it, in Washington, because um, he was also kind of into architecture and so on. And he was, uh, Jackie Kennedy was kind of what they call fag hag. Um, and she loved hanging out with gay guys, and Bill Walton was one of them, and Gore Vidal was another, and they would hang out in Provincetown and things like that. Of course, today, that would never be allowed to happen. But when Kennedy is killed um, in Dallas, one of the people they trust the most is Bill Walton, the Kennedy family. And he was about to take a kind of cultural goodwill mission to Moscow and meet with artists, because he was an artist himself and painters. And Bobby comes to him and says, keep 
going, go to Moscow, even though the president's dead, and carry a message for me and Jackie that we don't blame the Soviet Union. We know the communists were not behind this, uh, which is a remarkable thing. Uh, and, and, and further, he says, let them know we know it was a high-level domestic plot in this country. So at the height of the Cold War, the Attorney General of the United States, the grieving brother of uh, the dead president, is sending this message, remarkable message, to Moscow. Um, Bobby knew right away what had happened, by the way. He figured out, as my earlier book, Brothers, goes into. I interviewed over 150 people in the Kennedy family and the Kennedy administration, and I know for a fact that Bobby Kennedy was one of the first so-called conspiracy theorists. And through his, he was a, uh, you know, one of the best investigators in the country, of course. He'd uh, come up uh, investigating the Senate, uh, through the Senate Rackets Committee, investigating the mob. Uh, as Attorney General, he went after organized crime more vigorously than any other attorney general. But he knew this was a CIA hit. He knew it came out of the CIA operation against Castro, that assassination operation, which was run by William Harvey, the guy I, I mentioned earlier. And he knew that the CIA was in league with the mafia and um, that they used the mafia to do some of their dirty work. Jack Ruby was clearly, as Bobby figured out right away, a mafia errand boy who was given the job of shutting up Lee Harvey Oswald. Anyway, I'm sorry for that aside. Back to you, Jimmy Carter. Yeah, I think Jimmy Carter was a very decent, well-meaning man who um, certainly with his human rights policy, I think, uh, put America on the right track, and I think it had a real uh, impact in Latin America. Uh, I think he got, um, though, uh, he, he ended up capitulating to some of these national security forces uh, towards the end of his presidency in a way to save his presidency, I think. Um, my suspicion, by the way, is that he uh, was, you know, the victim of uh, Reagan and uh, George Bush and William Casey uh, plotting at the, uh, during the end of that campaign. The October surprise, I think, is the reality. They clearly met George Bush and William Casey, the future head of the CIA under Reagan, with uh, representatives from um, the government in Iran and basically promised them the arms for hostage deal. Um, you hold off, don't release the hostages while Carter's president, and we'll make sure that you get the arms you want. I think there's no doubt about that. Yeah, so uh, the woman asked about the uh, plane crash that killed Senator Paul Wellstone, who was one of America's most progressive senators from Minnesota. It was during his campaign, was it? Yeah, and for, I have not done the research on that, so I can't tell you um, much more than I'm sure you've already read. The uh, gentleman asked about 9-11 and sort of the backstory there. Uh, you know, again, uh, regretfully, I haven't done the research I should. Uh, I have done some, and I know the people I have a lot of faith in, like Peter Dale Scott, who's the retired professor at Berkeley, um, who's done a lot of important work on so-called deep politics, um, or the deep state. Um, <laughs> certainly believes that we're not, we haven't been told the real story, the full story about 9-11. At the very least, um, I think this is what happened. And I'm, again, I'm, uh, it's largely, you know, informed speculation. I haven't done the research like I've done on the Cold War and so on. But I think um, certainly the president and, that, and Cheney and the administration knew. They had all these, you know, flashing red signals that um, a terror attack was going to happen. Uh, that was not a surprise, the way they later portrayed it. Uh, and I think uh, our defenses were down, and I think there might have been a reason for those defenses to be down. I think that there was um, a feeling in some circles in Washington that we should have a terror attack, and that it would give the license to the administration to do what they immediately did, 
which was to push through this incredibly pr repressive uh, program. Uh, it was a power grab that left uh, the Americans, uh, people of America, still in a state of emergency. How many people know we're still in a state of emergency? That has allowed them to suspend civil liberties and develop this massive, massive surveillance uh, system that Ed Snowden, at great risk to himself, uh, has warned us about. So yeah, I think 9-11 is very uh, sketchy. Um, I, did they, as some people say, you know, wire the buildings in uh, Manhattan? I can't go that far based on what I've read. But I certainly think there was a cynicism there, and at the very least, probably, uh, you know, those planes were allowed to strike the targets, um, and that they immediately, particularly Cheney, cynically took full advantage of it, Cheney and Rumsfeld were part of this change of government group. How many people know about that? COG, change of government. So from the Cold War days on under Eisenhower, um, there were preparations made uh, at the highest levels of government in, in case America was hit by a massive nuclear attack and was essentially decapitated, the president killed and the top leaders. And so a kind of alternate uh, government uh, ruling circle was developed uh, people were appointed um, who were, in the event of a nuclear attack, you know, were to be put in bunkers. That's where Cheney went that day, his bunker, an undisclosed location. And so they would be, uh, survive in order to keep running the country. Um, and at some point earlier in their careers, both Cheney and Rumsfeld were appointed to this group. And, you know, one of the also sort of parts of this game plan was to suspend uh, constitution, the, the Constitution um, and basically declare martial law in the event of this traumatic attack. And essentially some version of that is what was put into effect after 9-11. So I do think there was a, a, a deep level of cynicism and probably, uh, you know, exploitation uh, of this event um, the event might have been allowed to happen even though they had all these warnings about it for that reason. And look, they were given enormous license after that. The American people were so traumatized that uh, we basically let them do whatever they wanted. And, you know, that's my great fear now about Trump and his campaign is that, you know, if there's a terror attack again in this country during the campaign, you know, will we again uh, rush to suspend all, you know, whatever liberties we have left and empower um, this tyrant. Yeah, to me, you see, that's the, my profession. I spent my whole life in the media, and it's, I've seen how the sausage gets made, and it's the most dismaying thing to me at my age now to see what's become of, this, uh, of the news profession. And we see, you know, people like, who, how many people saw the movie about Dan Rather, played by Robert Redford? You know, what was it called, Truth? Yeah, and you know, I mean, again, not many people see these things. I mean, we're being told this, how the media really works here and there, but n not, most people don't, you know, aren't aware of this. The, the American media has been, uh, you know, a corporate racket, you know, throughout my life. And uh, it's become obvious to me that this, this is the case. When the internet came along, I was, you know, ecstatic because I thought, okay, this was going to, as many of us felt, democratize media for the first time in my lifetime in the in America. And so I left the newspaper, which was a Hearst run newspaper in San Francisco, the old examiner, and uh, I scraped together a little money from Apple um, and started a salon. And we truly were inmates running the asylum. They didn't, know, the investors, the advertisers didn't really know what this thing was. We didn't even know whether the web could be a publishing medium at that point. So we got away literally with whatever we wanted to do. Even when uh, you know, we jumped into the Clinton impeachment crisis and we started breaking one story after the next about Ken Starr and uh, what you know, you know, sort of the underlying story there was, um, we got death threats, bomb threats, uh, advertising boycotts, but we were um, 
just sort of ecstatically doing whatever we wanted to do. We thought there would be dozens of salons because what salon had was a professional newsroom. I had come out of the news business. I knew how to build a newsroom. I knew how to hire people who knew what they were doing, investigative reporters. And we had the resources to actually run a newsroom. I mean, it was you know a fraction of the size of the New York Times or even the Chronicle. I think at a height, we had probably 60 editorial employees. But you can do a lot of damage with 60 good editorial employees. And we were. We were making an impact. Um, and so, but what happened was the same suspects, the same corporate powers, quickly swooped down the internet. And as we now now know, you know, 10 major companies, including Google, for God's sake, and you, Yahoo, which are supposedly media companies, began sucking up all the energy in the room and all the resources and all the advertising. And the, you know, the rest were left to scramble for the crumbs. So it became very uh, difficult to sustain a business model that could support a newsroom. And then when Ariana Huffington, who had used to work for me, started off in the internet, she knew nothing about the internet until I came to Ariana and said, you want to start writing for me? But she learned fast, and she's a good hustler. And she developed a business model that was like Tom Sawyer. Hey, paint my fence for free. It's fun, you know? And so she got all these writers to start writing for her for free, just to have their name, you know, in, in the Huff Huffington Post. I think that was another tragic turn that American journalism made because you can't do sustained investigative reporting unless you have a, a paid a salary. It takes too long, it's too difficult, and as a result, you have the era of just people saying whatever's on the top of their mind, and that's journalism. It's all meta commentary, it's all, you know, babble, and there's no real reporting. And I have to say, even Salon has gotten that in direction more and more since I left. It's more about, you know, commentary rather than real journalism. That's why I started, little ad here, Hot Books. So Hot Books is this new imprint that I've developed with a great scrappy uh, independent publisher in New York called Skyhorse. And um, our first book was called The Beast Side, Living and Dying While Black in America by a young um, uh, black writer in Baltimore, D. Watkins. It's a terrific collection of essays. He was interviewed by Terry Gross and on Meet the Press. You might have seen him. Uh, great book. Ta-Nehisi Coates' book kind of eclipsed it a bit, but it's well worth uh, checking out. This was our next book, The Burn Pits. This is a major uh, story involving the military by a military whistleblower named Joe Hickman. How many people have heard of the, the Burn Pits in Iraq and Afghanistan? Great. So the burn pits are these huge open-air uh, waste pits where the military uh, at every base in Iraq and Afghanistan dispose of virtually everything, plastics, uh, metals, uh, medical waste, old uh, munitions, body parts, um, and it creates 24-7 these plumes of toxic uh, smoke that our soldiers are forced to breathe in night and day. At one base, it was so bad, uh, Joe interviewed uh, hundreds of soldiers returning from uh, these bases that, in desperation, uh, they would put white towels against the ventilators, uh, in the ventilation in their rooms, their barracks, and by morning would be just, these white towels would be completely black with this shit that was pouring out of these uh, open air pits. Um, it's caused a epidemic of respiratory, rare es respiratory disease among these otherwise healthy young soldiers, men and women, and rare brain cancers, including uh, the brain cancer, the type of cancer that Bo Biden came back from Iraq with. We feel that uh, he was probably killed as a result of this. And to make it even worse, these open air burn pits were operated and built by Dick Cheney's company, Halliburton, KBR, uh, t with great profit. Uh, they are now the target of uh, class action lawsuit. This, we believe, is going to be the Agent Orange of the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Thousands of soldiers, and not to mention the, the civilians who live downwind from these military bases have, have been affected by this. Um, another book, which I think is going to be a very explosive book, is by a philosophy professor at uh, University of San Francisco, Rebecca Gordon, who um, 
who worked in Central America during the Reagan wars there as a, as a human rights activist. And she's written a book called American Nuremberg, the US officials who should stand trial for post 9-11 war crimes. And we're talking about President Obama, President Bush on down. So again, this is I think going to provoke uh, the kind of debate that we want America to be having at this point because certainly our presidential campaign doesn't raise the kind of questions that America should be grappling with. Um, no one, to my knowledge, they, we, they talk all the time, Trump and the others, about how we love our veterans, but no one has been talking about one of the worst calamities that our veterans are facing right now from these burn pits. Um, anyway, so I, what I keep doing, my job as a journalist, is to keep finding niches here and there, whether it's Salon uh, and now Hot Books, a way to get the truth out to people. But, you know, it's, it can be dismaying because, I mean, we're up against this enormous media apparatus with the cable news and, and uh, everything else that kind of, um, you know, makes it difficult for, for us to break through that. Um, but I think without a, an alternative media, we're, we're really in trouble. I love Democracy Now! I think Amy Goodman does a great job. There's some great local journalism being done uh, throughout the country in the Bay Area, uh, 48 Hills, Tim Redman's blog in San Francisco, uh, some of the great work being done at the uh, public radio um, and Pacifica radio. So, you know, there are pockets, but you have to be, you have to be kind of a um, dedicated citizen to seek out those sources of information. Should we take a couple more? Okay, great. The woman here. <coughs> yes, yeah, so she asked about the Dulles brothers' power in relation to J. Edgar Hoover, the longtime director of the FBI. I would say that Hoover was um, lower on the chain of command than the Dulles brothers, and he felt the same way. They often clashed. They were obviously these power barons in Washington that had their own turf. But when push came to shove and when there was some conflict between the CIA and the FBI, Hoover invariably would back down. Dulles tried to sort of paper over some of their differences by having um, a liaison, uh, you know, a couple, the key ones, uh, you know, work with Hoover to sort of make nice on him. He, you had a big ego. Dulles, I think, tried to avoid those clashes, but when you know, when he couldn't avoid it, he, he, the CIA ran the show. Look, the FBI were basically cops. They were Catholics. They were working class guys. Hoover was not very sophisticated. He wasn't Ivy League. The, uh, you know, CIA were Ivy League, white shoe law firm, Wall Street guys. They had a lot more class. And in fact, Eisenhower's own son, uh, John Eisenhower, who served with him in the White House, said that when the CIA guys came in, to you know, talk to Ike, Ike would always defer to them. Because again, this class thing, that's very deeply inbred, in, I think, in people. And Ike was, this, you know, in comparison, a simple guy from Kansas, you know, had gone to West Point. And again, was no match for these Yale and Harvard guys. One last question. Yes, here in the front. That's a, that's a good question. Yeah, well, thank you for uh, mentioning Season of the Witch, a book that will not die. It keeps <laughs> selling. It's, it's four years on the bestseller list, The Chronicle. And I'm very proud of that. It's uh, because, you know, my books can be dark, and Season of the Witch, of course, has its own share of darkness. But by and large, it's about how we, try, we meaning the sort of forces of fun and enlightenment, <laughs> triumphed in one city, at least for a while. Not so much these days. Um, but, 
Yeah, if FDR had lived, that's a very, one of those great, you know, if only questions. I'm reading uh, Philip K. Dick's, you know, book, The High Castle, right now. Of course, another what if. What if, uh, you know, the Nazis had won? And it's set in San Francisco, which makes it very interesting. Um, I think, number one, FDR, I believe, would have put the Dulles brothers on trial. There would have been a so-called banker's trial in uh, Washington afterwards. There was very strong evidence. Uh, in fact, uh, Arthur Goldberg, who later became a Supreme Court justice, who uh, served with the, uh, Alan Dulles in the OSS, later said this, that both Dulles brothers were guilty of treason. They should have been put on trial. I think FDR uh, and Henry Morgenthau and, and his uh, colleagues were amassing uh, you know, a lot of evidence about how Foster in New York and Allen in Switzerland were collaborating with the enemy. Uh, and so that's number one. Uh, number two, I think the New Deal would have continued. What's fascinating, and I tell this story in, in The Devil's Chessboard, is the kind of concerted backlash there was against the New Deal once FDR, this charismatic figure, uh, is dead. And Harry Truman, of course, couldn't hold a candle to him in that way. I mean, it, again, it's class in a way. FDR is this great master uh, of power in some ways because he'd gone to school with these guys, the guys he was up against, the Dulles brothers and their type. He knew what made them tick. He knew how to outmaneuver them. Um, without that kind of forceful leader, I think the New Deal uh, is lost. It, it doesn't have uh, someone at the helm. And so what happens is the Republican Party, in part to prevent the, the sort of uh, trials that they knew might be coming for them, the political trials, you know, I think help orchestrate this massive anti-communist red baiting scare that they proceed to use to purge Washington of the New Deal. And Dick Nixon, of course, and Joe McCarthy are two of their instruments in doing that. Joe McCarthy gets out of control. He becomes like a Donald Trump. He's uh, a monster that has to be put down. And the story of how they do that is fascinating because everyone thinks, oh, Trump was finally put down, uh, Trump, <laughs> McCarthy was finally put down by the army, the famous army McCarthy hearings. But actually, the person who draws the first blood on Joe McCarthy is Alan Dulles. And that story is in my book. So, yeah, I think uh, what happened as a result of Roosevelt dying is this massive political purge uh, go, gets underway. Uh, the blacklist, the, uh, the McCarthy period that unfortunately eradicates American political life of some of its most civilizing and enlightened elements that Ro Franklin Roosevelt had brought in. And with that cheery note, I will be back to this table, right? Drinking and writing. Sure. Great, thank you. Yeah, sure. So I'd just like to say thank you to Maria Roden of Arinda Books. Uh, Maria will be selling Mr. Talbot's books in the back, and Mr. Talbot will actually be over here in the lobby on the way out signing books. So thank you for that. <laughs>